I'd like to introduce our first poet for the evening. I'd like to introduce Sasha Lee Kling, who is a fourth generation Puerto Rican poet. She was last published by Snapdragon, a journal of art and healing from the poem In Our Books. She was featured a featured poet in both the MIA, I guess my MIA series, The Manifest, and with the Hawaii Poets Society. And while in Hawaii, she was nominated for the 2019 Biography Prize from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Currently, she's a visiting professor in the English department of St. Thomas University, Sasha Lee Kling. My first piece is called Evolution of Cough, Lifting Up the Skirts of Lady Liberty. She hands me a cup of joe while lucky strikes whistle acrid dragons on wayward roads, railing against development of a young nation strapped on the back of a Detroit Express. She tries to hide the methane behind stacks of promising future, and they call it progress. She grabs a glass of champagne punch. It's the bee's knees, you know, a spring in my gear, oiled up for production, prices for the new Hoover model, barely affordable, but everyone wants one. A Kenmore can't clean discrimination, so Rosie reminds workers that equal work equals lesser money in barren pockets as housewives leave empty nests, and they call it progress. She dreams of an uncultivated land as it masks the roar of the Vietnam War, which brought jet planes and John Lennon. They choked those left behind, a vogue of gender norms. Impossible to see through burning bras stripped their names, a generic conquest. She cannot tell the difference, and they call it progress. Liberty never makes up her mind, especially at midnight, that nasty in between, because Google can't help her find the way to femininity as soft power hardens, as more families crave cars, create harm, smudging up the light at the end of the smog, a clear picture of modernity. And they call it progress? No, Alexa, call my iRobot Roomba, progress, be damned. Thank you, Sasha Lee. Uh, next up, we have Marnino Toussaint, a South Florida based poet and hip hop artist and activist and teacher. Uh, he's worked alongside the likes of actors Omari Hardwick and Victoria Justice, author Mary Pope Osborne, and he's opened for hip-hop legend Chuck D. And he's had the opportunity to perform at the Geffen Playhouse in Los Angeles in a ceremony honoring music legend and activist Harry Belafonte. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, this poem I'm going to read is called uh, Jack and Jill, right? Inspired by my mentor and director of the Art Prevails Project. Um, so here we go. <clears throat> Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down, broke his crown. And Jill, Jill is still standing with shaky knees hoping not to stumble from dehydration, taking from unreliable water sources. No wonder why we never see the headlines. No wonder why we never wonder why Jack is always in escapades, how he jumps over and through fires, how he climbs beanstalks to get a pinch of rain from the clouds, crazy. Crazy how fairy tales tell the truth. How the things we think are easy to come by are hills away for others. A water bill pales in comparison to pails of water spilled when it's your last drop Crazy how we crumble our faces to the signing, but never flinch for flint. Choose between purified and tap, but never tap into what's happening to our jacks and Jill's pale face from dirty waters. Ailments mixed in in Adam's ale. Apples don't fall far from trees, so there are whole families who have nothing left to drink. Thirst ain't quenched by vinegar and brown papers. There are people going home empty handed of resources that we find free. More than a the quarter of the world's population lacks access to clean water, so they are stuck, stumbling over hills matured into mountains while no one cares to learn. As long as their own thirst is quenched, hands are washed of it, blame it on ignorance, 
nursery rhymes always have a way of making the ugliest things sound singable. But I wonder, if it was you, would you sing the same song? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, we have Hippolito, the beard man, Aragia the <laughs> third. He was born and raised in the South Bronx in New York City. In 2003, at age 19, he joined the US Marine Corps and following four years of service, which included two deployments in Iraq, he separated from the military honorably. Post-service, he began seeking healing for the various injuries he had sustained, both physical and invisible, leading him on a journey of self-discovery. Hippolito is a trained Baptiste power yoga and trauma conscious yoga. He, he works with No Barriers Warriors as a wilderness expedition leader, guiding veterans on transformative curriculum-based adventures in nature and serves as a peer facilitator with warrior writers. <clears throat> he also happens to be a member of the Combat Hippies, um, for whom he serves as outreach uh, community director, writer, and performer as well. So thank you, Hippolito. Thank you, Jenny. <clears throat> Let's flash back to 2016. Months before the catastrophic election of November, gaining international attention in the media was the battle raging at Standing Rock. As many great movements, it started as youth driven, a cross country run from North Dakota to Washington DC, a mighty relay to raise awareness to the plight of these proud indigenous peoples. After centuries of surviving repeated colonial conquest after first contact, this savage legacy was still sadly alive in the modern age. Water protectors conscious of our link to the earth stood up in defense of our sacred mother against greed, corruption, and corporations. I could not comprehend how this was happening in America. Video footage showed heavily armored law enforcement officers disguised as not so special ops straight out of your favorite video game or sci-fi click. Empire Strikes Back. Dispatching weapons, unfortunately familiar to me from military experience against unarmed U.S. civilians, many of whom descended from our nation's original inhabitants. Mine-resisted vehicles, high-tech drones, high-powered rifles complete with optics, and the most notorious from D.A.P.L., a water cannon deployed in sub-freezing temperatures. It was enough to send your local libertarian on a psycho-induced frenzy, and I was ready to join them. I wasn't craving a fight. What drew me were the peaceful and powerful methods First Nation peoples deployed to counteract the pipeline's henchmen. Violence was not an option, and still torn from war, I deeply resonated with these principles. As they constantly faced cruelty, they sung louder, they prayed louder and beat their drums louder as traditions passed down through generations taught them. War has converted me into a pacifist or better yet, a damn hippie. I learned that violence is never a solution. It's essentially a fundamental breakdown of communication and ultimately leads to no solution, just more confrontation an endless cycle of chaos which has no victors, only victims. While in Iraq, I constantly clashed in my mind and soul with the moral impacts that came with serving as an occupying force on foreign, formerly sovereign soil. It ate at me tirelessly, seeing myself and the people that I was ready to at a moment's notice flow to hell. I've been there plenty of times myself. So jumping on a charter bus and riding 22,000 miles into the unknown seemed by far the sensible thing to do. I was instantly mesmerized by the seemingly endless rows of various First Nation flags flying in the cold, crisp breeze encircling the camp. Few things I've seen can be described as more beautiful. At the sacred fire, immediately I felt the trapped tears escaped my eyes as hand drums 
and hollow words cradled me. Comforted, I cried out in pain, finally ready to release the anguish for so long I've carried. In frigid temperatures with wind chill, it was reported as being negative 30 degrees. Thousands of veterans and indigenous people stepped forward in a dynamic show of unity, advancing towards the blockade that had been until recently been manned by police like a combat outpost in Marja or Ramadi. Freezing, I absorbed the impressive show of love that was unfolding. This was the largest gathering of veterans since the Vietnam War. The purpose was protection. It was the first time wearing uniform that I felt proud of my action. No longer was I a destroyer, but now a preserver of people and our planet connecting with my native roots in the process. The next day, a Lakota chief summed it up perfectly. Soldiers follow orders. Warriors do what's right. Sasha Lee, you're up again. Uh, yes. <clears throat> History of the Hurricane. Maria hit Puerto Rico as a Category 5 with maximum sustained winds of 270 kilometers per hour. September 20th, 2017, a text wakes me. We are alive. That's all. No details to calm nerves as they jump to wrong conclusions. There isn't time for red or purple hearts, no smiley faces, no time for prayer, just a lonely text, three words, and a hope that Papi isn't lying. I close WhatsApp and open my contacts. I dial, I wait, and wait, and wait. Bile rises from stomach to heart. I can't swallow the images of muddy waters taking over my tiny island. Facebook videos with devastating HD quality, hashtag Hurricane Maria, as waves rush over broken piles of homes. Putting my iPhone down, I close my eyes and pray. I make promises to every deity that crosses my mind, pitted God against God, that whoever won would have my love and loyalty. I would fall at the feet of Krishna as he crushes Zeus, please make my family safe. I take a last look at my father's photo, handshake as I hang up mid ring. I needed to hear him, his voice sinking through my psyche, a dependency since birth. And I, like a cocaine fuel junkie needed to sustain my addiction to his words an LSD hallucination that even Maria couldn't erase. Hashtag pray for Puerto Rico. Four and a half hours later, my phone rings. We are alive. We have meat and a gas stove. My father's brain laugh is the sweetest, most annoying sound I'd ever want to hear. Hands finally unclench, mouth dry asking, do you need anything? Six days have passed. No electricity and fuel on low. Hashtag stay strong, Puerto Rico. I fold socks, water bottles, spam cans, and Vienna sausages. Tears past the bridge of my nose. Two more bags of Duracell D batteries in a USPS box. Because if it fits, it'll ship. My love too big to send, and I pray. At 25 days, Papi shares a video of down palm trees dipped in a serpentine pool, a crooked tropical drink, unwanted and undrinkable. Hashtag Boricua, hasta la muerte. And it might just be if there aren't any prayers left. After 96 days, all I see on my Twitter feed, hashtag pray for Vegas, hashtag Vegas shooter, Hashtag pray for Mandalay Bay. Hashtag pray for California. Hashtag California wildfire. Hashtag skirball fire. But there are no prayers left. No more hashtag pray for PR.
Wow. All right. <clears throat> I saw someone toss a crumbled Coca-Cola can out of their beat-up Honda Accord today. Watch the street reluctantly catch it like a bad child does a mother's gaze. I thought to myself, how hard was it to keep it in a cup holder until he reached his final destination? How much of a nuisance that Coca-Cola can really was to his evening drive? I thought maybe, just maybe, it was just a slip of the hand. And then I looked to see there are too many empty cans on the streets to even think with a glass half full mentality on my way home to work down West End Road. I never see the street play back, stop to anything but cigarette buds. Makes me wonder why our neighborhood is a fishing net for leftovers. I wonder if we ever looked under the hood, would we ever find we're not moving right because there's too much dirt in our engine? Then I wonder how hard it is to actually take care of something that never gave you drive in the first place. I live in the same city for most of my life. I went to school called Fairway Elementary. We were the home of the Earth Keepers. An ironic name for a neighborhood full of kids who toss their trash because the burden is too heavy to carry. We litter because, because most of them haven't seen a world past the county line. It's hard to learn about global warming when your block is hot. Hard to care about clean air when breathing is a miracle in itself. Sometimes I sit and wonder why it's so much easier to cl and cleaner on affluent sides. Then I realize how much easier it is to take, in, take care of a place that takes care of you. I get out of my car usually. I pick up after my brother's mess just like my mother taught me. Today, I just look at that twist, twisted can Wonder how different the streets could be if it was just considered home. If you didn't have to carry the weight of the world and the shoulders without even seeing it. These days, inmates on work assignment keep the streets more than neighborhoods do. Clean slates incentivize more than climate change. How much heat do we have to take before we consider this world home? Boys are buried in the ground here, so men must hold grudges against the land. Blame it for swallowing their kin whole. Pour liquor down his throat and hope to keep it off balance for just a little while longer, I think. No one really takes care of the earth here because they are afraid of becoming one with it. But one thing is true. And that's just because this isn't the suburbs, it doesn't make it any less our home. And our mom always taught us to clean up, clean up after ourselves. That God never blesses someone unless they take care of what they have first. Mother nature or nurture, I have a feeling she thinks the same way. Let me start by stating what I'm about to share in no way is intended to take away or make light of the very real suffering caused by this global pandemic. My heart extends to all those afflicted. May you be free from suffering. But I have to say, thank you, Rona. This Earth Day is looking to be the best ever as far as Earth Days go. Not so much for us per se, more for the planet specifically. Ecologically, the general consensus amongst believers of science, magic, and facts are, we're pretty much fucking things up. That's beyond debate at this point. On a lighter note, bears are back to picnicking in Yosemite and Yellowstone. Porpoises are getting it popping in Venice and fossil fuel emissions are descending almost as fast as the stock market or the president's disapproval rating. But I digress. It's hard to dispute our great mother earth seems better off keeping socially distant from us. Don't get me wrong, I love the outdoors. Getting lost in nature is one of my favorite things. Not lost like search and rescue loss, rather lost in my thoughts on trail lost in the radiance of trees, lost in the spells of whispering streams. Reports are circulating of rivers and beaches being the cleanest since, since, since Earth Day became a thing 50 years ago. Who would have thought? 
hitting the pause button on society would benefit the environment. But our collective sacrifices have given the planet a much needed boost. Thank you, Rona. Recently, people have taken to growing their own food and sewing their own masks like my wife and baking their own challah bread, challah back. Through these ridiculously trying times, we're learning our value is not measured in spreadsheets and productivity, but in our ability to adapt and, and be self-reliant. Thank you, Rona, for reminding us who we truly are at our core. We've been blinded by business, barely surviving our busyness and forgotten to live, functioning on fumes. The Himalayas are visible from parts of Northern India for the first time in 30 years. A marvelous metaphor for these unprecedented times. The road ahead is shaky, yes, obscure and certainly strenuous, but if we can hold steady, keep our heads lifted, just beyond the horizon awaits the magic mountains within ourselves, sturdy, tenacious, and unyielding. Thank you, Rona, for revealing and reflecting hard truths. A bitter mirror, we are made better by you. Another major thread intertwining us all. How ironic, a virus may end up being the cure after all. Woo. My last piece is called Pacific Caribbean Waters, Water Wisdom and Connectivity. Two islands anchored latitude by attitude on sacred Mauna Kea top, a longitude of blood choosing family over family, a federal highway of misinformation, a line drawn on red earth, tears mixed heritage of saline, and salt, stuck in moral famine, connect Aina to Puerto Rican roots as scientific bureaucracy taunts sacred sands, test strange theories of eugenics, depopulates a people seen through telescopic lens where the bottom line is divine. Street law against loose jaws on leaked feeds call heroes whores. Mocks as Hurricane Maria stacks cadavers in an understaffed morgue, another skeleton in government office, and the abused finally bark. Hashtag renuncia Ricky, hashtag Ricky renuncia. A process of trauma charted on huracan winds from beach to mountain with a freedom of speech that doesn't quick translate to Polynesian paradise as Mo'olelo Koa chant meles, as Boricuas march on colonial San Juan, invited guard dogs to stand down and love struggles from sidelines. Hashtag Puerto Rico se levanta. Hashtag we are Mauna Kea. A concrete solidarity gifted by ancestors silenced by splinter groups interested in their own selfish survival even when both sides have the same eyes, sisters cause dissonance in Spanish and pigeon, flags in hand ruled by world lines on a flat map and 32 inches. Thank you. Whenever I had nightmares, I would always run into my grandmother's room and tuck myself below her oak tree arms until I fell asleep again. Words from grandma. If I'm ever not around to love you into a dream, just close your eyes and pray. Life is a lot scarier with your eyes open, a lot darker with your eyes open. So I found myself wrapped around rosaries, planted the prayer rugs, just trying to dream something beautiful. Have you ever noticed the world isn't all that beautiful? Like maybe it's broken, hardly mosaic, barely stained glass stunning here. You can't unlearn fear, can't unhear gunshot, can't unhinge it from your loved ones. And yes, 
life is a lot scarier when you have loved ones. If I've learned anything about fear is that it cannot exist where there's perfect love. And if I've learned anything about prayer since my grandmother passed is that I've been doing it wrong. Trying to pray the loss back to life when I should be trying to pray the life back into you who tiptoe around landmines, walk with crosses tied to your spine, you with only 140 characters worth of catharsis, you who's broken like, like Paris, like Cali, like the peaceless parts of the Middle East, you who left pieces of your hearts in gunpowder, I'll be honest, my ears are still wet to this. I can't remember the last time we televised fear here behind industrialization, my angel wing innocence hasn't been clipped yet. Feathers still unruffled, but hashtags are just like obituaries and every day I log in and see something new has died and I know that. How it feels like warm bodies squirming within bed sheets below your belly button. How it feels like cage bird beneath your ribs. So when you cry, it sings something like slave song. I know death. How it feels like nostalgia. A couple hours after one drink too many. So once you're throwing up all the butterflies you forgot to use last night, you can't help but feel regret. And I know death. How it's everything like the movies, except nothing like the movies really. You always expect them to come back to life. It's just here, they never do. So I can't help but hurt. Can't help but wade in thorn brush. Some things cut too deep to ignore. And other things you can't just grin and bear. Even after being taught to dig a smile from beneath your lips like a subterranean sun, I found myself trying to dream others out of nightmares, trying to build an oak tree out of my tongue so mourning families can fall into my prayers like a safety net, trying to pray as loud as army thunder because if there's one thing harder than a fight is doing it alone, so I'm praying with you. But nightmares don't go away as easily as it would in somebody's arms. Let's put the world in our arms. Hold it as tight as a nervous belly. Love it until we get global warming and a valid explanation. Love it like my grandma loved me, no. Like somebody loved you before you locked them in a memory quote. It's always dark before the glory of sunrise. So will you love, will you pray until it's bright enough to see something? Mm. What Earth Day means to me. I love the earth. She is our mother and provides all we need. I wish she was a person so I could give her a big hug. When I grow up, I want to be an explorer and travel the whole world. It is such a big place with so many different animals and people. I want to see them all and hug them too. Up until my early 20s, my concept of nature consisted of Central Park trips, dingy hood pigeons, and a rare trek over the George Washington into New Jersey. I was a city kid through and through. The idea of the woods scared me, frankly. They were mysterious, way too quiet, and not the safest of places for people of color in this country historically. I didn't trust nature. Nah, you won't catch me slipping, pimpin'. There's a reason only white people seem to get mauled by lions, killed by tigers, and attacked by grizzlies. I mean, come on. My comfort zone was concrete, dull color palettes, and tagged up subway cars, sometimes smelling of urine. Where I'm from, the only people who slept outside didn't choose to. It just happens that way sometimes. As a kid, you never get used to seeing junkies and winos roaming the streets. Guess that's why wild animals made me afraid. Gratefully, I've learned the era of my misguided ways. Wasn't until boot camp I finally felt the feeling of truly being outdoors. But I was too busy trying not to die and dodging screaming drill hats to really take it in. The next four years, I spent lots of days running through humid North Carolina swamps and driving on dusty sand dunes in Northern Iraq. Somewhere in between, I fell in absolute love with the natural world. Stargazing the desert sky, tracing the Milky Way with my curious thoughts saved my sanity out there. The enormity of countless sparkling stars, light years away, filling my panorama blew my mind and helped me mentally escape my conflict zone confinement. 
Growing up bathed in light pollution, I felt robbed. I wondered how many others have been lost in its sheer wonder. If more were, perhaps we'd war less. What a blessing this all is. Creation is a manifestation of love. What else is powerful enough to conceive such bountiful beauty? She literally gives us all we need, and yet it's not enough to satisfy our greed and overconsumption. Two and a half years later, the destruction and devastation brought on by Maria is apparent in Puerto Rico, another calamitous consequence of warming oceans and global climate. Last year, I got the chance to tour many parts of the 35 by 100 mile wide Isla, catching a magnificent sunrise in the lush tropical gardens of Utuado, climbing the breathtaking cliffs, oceanside cliffs overlooking the Atlantic and Arecibo, and scrambling on slippery rocks underneath a roadside waterfall in El Yunque. Yes, it's true. I may not have always enjoyed being in nature, but thankfully, nature has always been in, we in me. Thank you. Thank you, Hippolito, and thank you to all of our poets. Um, th thank you all for sharing your work with us. That was really um, generous of you to, to, to do your poems here tonight. Um, we're going to uh, shift a little bit to our Eco Cultura community organizer who's gonna talk a little bit about um, Miami Climate Alliance and uh, as our partner and also as a reflection of um, how the work that they do relates to the issues that were um, addressed in, in your work. Thank you all so much. And I wanna encourage anyone who's watching on Facebook um, to definitely put questions in the comments as well. Thanks, go ahead, David. You need to unmute yourself. <laughs> unmute, okay. Thank you so much, Jenny. And um, let's give it up one more time for our, our poets and, uh, and the poets, the poetry that they just delivered. Um, yes, as Jenny said, I'm a founding member of the Miami Climate Alliance. The Miami Climate Alliance um, is a coalition of 90 plus um, organizations, mainly locally based community organizations here in Miami-Dade County. Um, we came in, into existence around in 2015. And um, back then there was exactly zero dollars in a $6.8 billion county budget to address sea level rise and climate change. Even though the World Bank had declared Miami the single most at risk uh, location in the world to the effects of climate change. And suddenly fast forward to now, there's now, um, six, uh, there's now um, over $20 billion in the five-year capital plan for the county to address resilience adaptation products, pro projects. And then $192 million that, um, that the city of Miami residents um, passed in a bond for community resilience. So suddenly we've got a lot of money that's pumping into this problem. And so the Miami Climate Alliance is still very active to try to make sure with all this money that there is transparency, accountability, and community input. And so that that money isn't used to gentrify our communities and to um, exacerbate some of the problems that, uh, that we're already beginning to face and that we know are coming much larger into the future. And so I'm really drawn to a lot of elements of, of your poetry. Um, and so some, some things that stuck out to me um, that we're dealing in ridiculously trying times and um, this ability to adapt and be self-reliant that comes up in your poems is, is, uh, is so central. And, I'm, um, and the Miami Climate Alliance has ways that we can actually address and connect and be um, able to address some of the issues that you brought up. And so you, um, I see greed and overconsumption. I see um, uh, things being much harder to come by across all of our neighborhoods and communities and especially those who are most vulnerable and economically on the edge. We're seeing that, that the testing and that the um, resources and, and many of the items that we need are, are not available. And, um, and so the Miami Climate Alliance has a program and it's called the Community EOC Program, the Community Emergency Operations Center Program. And we also run a Miami-Dade County Street Response Disaster Relief Team that's run by Dr. Armin Henderson in Liberty City 
in, ha in Little Haiti and in um, some of the other neighborhoods right around there. Um, they've gone around door to door um, talking with people. We've also gone through and called through our call list. And so these are many of the neighborhood-based organizations that work on the ground to plug in into these communities. So we do um, response after hurricanes. We also have done a big step up of our program um, in light of COVID. And then um, that's just our disaster prep work. We also um, do a lot of advocacy around clean energy and, um, and uh, some, some of the ways to address overconsumption and, and climate change across, across those issues. So um, I wanted to ask, I think one thing that is uh, so powerful in each of your poems is this ability to take this thing of climate change that for so long was really esoteric and out there and kind of removed from life, but you brought it into where it's a, a kitchen table sort of, uh, sort of thing, a thing that really um, kind of bombards us and gets in the, the kind of inner workings of our, of our life and our ability to, to, to do fundamental things. And so I'm just curious, um, curious what, uh, how, how um, that local sort of personal experience of climate change is, is it, it comes out in, in some of your work and, um, and how, you, um, how, you, how you animated that in, in, in your poems. If, uh, if you, each of you could take, take a little moment to, to hit on that. Um, if I could uh, start us off, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, for me, poetry is always very personal. So anytime it connects with my family and, and where I'm from or places where I've been to that I call home, that it almost writes the story itself for me. And so Hurricane Maria was deeply, deeply personal, especially since I was on the other side of the world in Hawaii while my dad and his side of the family were dealing with that situation. And then, so that was a really big connect for me. And then just, just, not being able to be there or even be two, three hours away by airplane or, or, or even contact them. So I was getting second and third and fourth and fifth hearsay as to who was okay and who wasn't. And so that, that hurricane just drastically changed communication. And so that's how the poem came about. Right. Um, well, I'll say uh, kind of like echoing what Sasha Lee said, which is like, you know, it comes uh, like everything uh, I write comes from a personal place, even if it's not uh, like co coherently like personal. Right. Like um, so when I wrote like, you know, uh, writing those pieces, like, you know, whether the Jack and Jill or whatever, like one. I think the first one is like really fun because it's you know a fairy tales and those things and like we we learn like all of these things that as kids we used to sing you know they actually had like these darker things like meanings behind them so I was like okay let's let's use that because I I feel like this is a thing that like you know climate change and like the, the earth being affected I feel like sometimes it feels like like those stories right like it just feels like a myth like you never like people don't believe it but it is real right uh, um so I felt like that was a a very clear and direct like uh, correlation but like that second one I think that one's really near to me near and dear to me because that I actually had that conversation with a friend where like seeing how people would destroy the place that they were living in like you know what I'm saying it was it was um it was almost scary but then it was also almost like understandable to think like okay if you don't see it as your home you'll never start to treat it like your home right um, and, and so like, I, I don't live there anymore, but, um, I, like, I, I love to hear that there's actually like things in place that like, hopefully I can, like, we can connect David and like, you know, actually work towards like, you know, not only just cleaning up these cities, but also making it sustainable, you know, like, I think that's, yeah. So I definitely, uh, feel similar to what Sasha Lee and Mar Nino have said. Um, I feel very connected to this um, idea of climate change. It's very personal now, as opposed to 10 years ago, 
when it was more of a concept, you know, we have all these raging um, climate issues and catastrophes facing us on a yearly basis, you know, the wildfires in California, these hyper hurricanes coming from the Caribbean now, um, climate gentrification happening in Little Haiti and Liberty City. It's a very real thing. And um, as I stated in uh, one of the poems, how I wasn't, you know, a very outdoors person as a kid, but I, I am now, you know, um, nature has been deeply therapeutic for me um, coming back from war. It's a place where I've really been able to heal and find myself and enjoying these places. It's bittersweet to know that uh, we are posing such a threat to these beautiful places, right? Um, I think about, will my children be able to uh, enjoy these places? And it's really sad. And so it's it's something that is plaguing us all, whether we, we want to admit it or not. Climate change is impacting us all very personally because we live on this planet. I mean, we don't have any plan Bs right now. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um so uh I have a question, a couple of comments that I'd like to share as well. Um, uh, so I was interested actually in Hippolito in your poem, um, you made this really interesting juxtaposition about um, being in uniform, serving as military to protect the earth. And I just kind of wanted to look at that juxtaposition for a second of how we think of military and how we think of earth and that we are at a point in our culture that we need to be in, unif in military uniform to protect the earth. So can, I, can you speak a little bit more about, um, about where that came from or what you, what you experienced in thinking about that? Yes, thank you for that question, Jenny. Um, yeah, when I had that realization in Standing Rock, it was, it felt like a lightning bolt struck me. I felt as though this was something that is actually worthy of being protected, not what we are deployed to do, protecting corporate um, whatever, corporate interests or whatever it is that we're fighting these wars for. I don't even know anymore, but I do know that protecting the planet is a worthy cause. The worthiest of causes if I might say. And so it really, um, it really changed me, it transformed me, it transformed my thinking. And I feel like that's still happening. I'm still um, in the process of evolving, but it definitely stirred something within me that was there that I was not able to access up until that point. It was a, that trip, for me was a spiritual awakening that I so desperately needed. And it was one of the hardest things maybe that I've ever done before as well. But, um, and I've seen a lot of the veterans in this generation becoming a lot more eco-conscious, a lot more hippie conscious, a lot more peace loving, because we understand, you know, who more, who more understands it than the ones who have been sent to, to, to fight wars endlessly. I mean, we've been at war since 2001 now. That's 19 years going on. It's ridiculous. Thank you. Oh, oh no, I'm not muted. <laughs> thank you for, thank you for sharing that. Um, <clears throat> so another question I, I thought of while I was listening to you all tonight was there was a really interesting turn of phrase in Sasha Lee's, in one of Sasha Lee's poems where, um, uh, you're talking about Puerto Rico and you're talking about Hurricane Maria, um, which raises questions about um, um, sustainability and are we really building our cultures to, uh, for, for preparedness and to sustain the kinds of natural disasters that we're now um, experiencing. Um, David, you spoke a little bit about um, the emergency operations center and the kind of climate emergencies that you all prepare for. And um, I definitely want to talk more about 
um, hurricanes in general, like as a climate crisis issue and, and, and how it's a hurricane maybe is different now than when it was when I was a kid, than it was when I was a kid. Um, and, um, however, <laughs> Sasha, you mentioned at, one, at this one moment, um, you were talking about, um, the impact on the island itself and, um, and not being there and being distant from it and needing to send supplies. And what was interesting is that you very distinctly said USPS box, if it fits, it ships. And I'm curious to know more about, you know, why in particular it was important to underscore that it was a service of the United States to take the package from one part of the United States to another part of the United States, which I think people forget is a part of the United States. And clearly that had to do with sustainability. Really. Um, well, it's, it's, it's funny because obviously there's FedEx, there's, you know, there's, there's other, other things that you can use besides USPS um, to ship things. One, it's their, it's their motto, right? If it, if it fits, if it, if it fits, it'll ship. But because my husband at that time was a service member, um, they, the, um, the USPS on the base, it gave us more of a flat rate as opposed to by weight, right? Because we were in Hawaii. So that was something that I needed to keep in, in mind because I'm sending cans, I'm sending, you know, D batteries, things that are very heavy. But if I would have used a different type of service, it would have been a lot more astronomically um, expensive than using USPS. And because it was affordable and in line with sustainability, it allowed me to, to use that service. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just looking over, um, I'm just looking over here to see if there were any questions from the comment chain. And there was one question about whether the performance and poems will be available to share. And I believe the answer to that is that first of all, all of these poets have their own uh, different channels on different social media. I'm saying that without knowing that for sure about everybody. I know Sasha Lee and Marnino do. <laughs> <laughs> um, not sure about hip. And also I believe this, uh, this is being recorded and will remain on our Facebook page, um, um, you know, after this event. So you can watch it after, you know, post live. Um, and um, I would definitely, I'm going to take a second now to ask, all the poets to share um, any websites or um, uh, social media channels or uh, handles or whatever that, that you'd like to share that people can go to to learn more about your work. So Sasha Lee, since you're here, you go first. <laughs> since, I'm, since I'm live in the live, yes. um, all my social media is under Sasha Lee K. So my name and then the first letter of my last name. So Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok. <laughs> if it's there, I probably have it under Sashley K. So LinkedIn, just kidding. <laughs> Actually, yes. <laughs> LinkedIn, uh, Basically, everything everything you can think of. I'm very IMDb. I'm very forward. <laughs> yes. You know, connect, connect. What is it? Virtual connectivity. Thank so, you. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Marnino, you got anything for us? Uh, yeah. Um, first, I want to say that um, if you're really on TikTok, actually, um, that's impressive <laughs> because I, I still have not gotten the hang of it. Um, <laughs> I'm trying really hard. Neither. <laughs> I'm an old mom, you know. Oh man, it's hard. Um, but um, on everything else, um, one of uh, my website is probably the best place. It's marnino.com, M A R N I N O. And otherwise, um, on social media, it's marnino underscore. So that would be the best. <laughs> great, great. Hippolito, do you have 
a website, social media, any any place where people can follow up with you? Yes. So uh, the website is thecombathippies.com. Uh, social media, The Combat Hippies. We're on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, I believe, as well. That's great. That's awesome. And David, what about the Miami Climate Alliance? What if people, and also like what kinds of things can people, if, if the poets, if the people watching, if anybody wants to get involved, um, either as a result of this, um, or because they already were looking for a way to get involved, can the Miami Climate Alliance um, be a kind of like portal to uh, action for, for Absolutely. people? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. The best way into the Miami Climate Alliance is through our Facebook. It's Miami Climate Alliance on Facebook. Check us out there. We are um, constantly involved in events, including co-hosting this event and um, three other um, Eco Cultura MDC Live Arts events this week um, that we helped co-host. And then we work with a lot of national partners um, and we put on national days of action. We also do a lot of advocacy at, at the city and county level. And that happens through our working groups. And our working groups are um, open to the public. They're very large. We have um, up to 80 people in one of our working groups. It's, a, um, it's the Resilient Miami working group that's focused on, um, on making sure that money is spent towards our communities in ways that we want and not gentrifying us. We also have a clean energy working group um, that uh, is very active and, and has all kinds of wins. And we have a disaster resilience working group and we have tons of others. So check us out on Miami Climate Alliance at, um, at Facebook, also online, miamiclimatealliance.org. You can find um, ways to support our Miami-Dade County Street Response Disaster Relief Team, um, led by Dr. Um, Armin Henderson and his volunteers um, on our site. So come check us out. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. And I also want to uh, thank everybody uh, encourage everybody, thank you all, and also encourage everybody who's listening and watching uh, to keep following MDC Live Arts. Follow us on all of our social media channels. If you're on our Facebook page already, you'll find everything you need there. Uh, check out our website as well, and as well as our Instagram feed, and stay tuned to this Facebook page uh, for more programs that are about the intersection of the arts and action. I want to encourage you to find ways to um, to create action around social, uh, sorry, climate crisis. Um, anything from, uh, you know, reusing uh, everything in your house, reducing waste, um, and uh, volunteering for these organizations that are also helping to make change on policy levels. Um, think about some of the things that came up in these poems about how we live uh, and how we treat the planet. Um, let's be conscious of, um, of sea level rise and everything we do as well. Um, so I'm going to say good night and definitely stay tuned to our Facebook page. Thank you for following MDC Live Arts tonight and Eco Cultura and please join us in this work towards addressing climate crisis in the arts and through action as well. Arts is a really powerful tool to get the word out. So thank you all for being here tonight and being that mouthpiece. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Great work, everybody. Great work. Okay, there you are. Okay. <laughs>